How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. The climate has always changed over thousands and millions of years, but the speed of changes in the last hundred years is unprecedented, and people living in cities disconnected from nature often don't notice until changes infiltrate their lived experience and places they care about. On the show today, we'll discuss connecting with nature in a hot and digital world with Phil Ginsberg, General Manager with the San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department, Nusheen Razani, Director of the Center for Nature and Health at UCSF in Oakland, and Rebecca Johnson, Citizen Science Lead at the California Academy of Sciences. And later in the show, we welcome youth activists who've made a difference by organizing climate strikes in the Bay Area. Getting outside and getting active, today on Climate One. Nusheen Razani, let's begin with you. You talk in your fabulous TEDx talk, and I think it was Nashville, about the loneliness of motherhood and how you missed your mother, and then you looked to a solution. So tell us that story. I, I'm a pediatrician by training, and I was a pediatric infectious diseases specialist, and I think that I was actually really arrogant about having kids. I thought I knew everything. I also had four brothers that I kind of raised and so I thought, you know, I, I have this, I got this. Um, and then I was living in the city, and I had my kids, and I just, I think there's no level of expertise, really, that could prepare me for the overwhelming isolation of the experience. And, and we don't talk about it that much, but it was like I was inside in four walls, and I had two and now three little crying beings, and actually much love to our city, but everywhere we would go, I actually had to fight their natural instincts, like if they wanted to climb something or walk over something or even sometimes just be in a space as a child, I had to rein that in. And it was like I was an enforcer of some sort, just saying no all the time, and I was really unhappy. Um, and I think after a while, I started noticing that when we were in natural spaces, and especially when we were in natural spaces and had free time, and I just like, I stopped. I didn't listen to everything that was telling them not to, to follow their natural instincts. Um, things were just easier. And even though I, I have a huge and juicy and wonderful family, um, I don't live near them, they live in another country. And, and so even though I was away from my support system and in a city, when I was in natural places, I felt connected. And I think you know, that was, for me, a bit of a savior. Um, and I actually changed my entire profession and I devoted myself to helping people get back into nature. Um, through that experience. So from that, you call it almost a yeah, breakdown. You, nature was your, was your um, prescription, your salvation. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Phil Ginsburg, let's talk. When you were a child growing up in suburban Philadelphia, when you were upset, you went to the backyard. Tell us about that place you went when you were, uh, um, em emotions were overwhelming you as a child. Uh, yeah, nature was always the place where I went for, for calm. We had this... Um, it wasn't really in our backyard. It was actually uh, sort of a uh, forested sort of border of, of our house. And it was uh, when I got in trouble for leaving uh, wet towels on the bed or uh, something else and I needed a little bit of uh, uh, me time, I went and to the same spot. There was a little spot in the woods that I just kind of hung out in and mm -hmm. uh, it made me calm. And then I could kind of come back and function and pick up the towels and all was good. Mm -hmm. um, and right near my house, there was also this, uh, this, this creek, Marion Creek, where I used to go. And this was at a time, you know, we probably all grew up in a time when being a child was 
less programmed and, and mm -hmm. less structured. And Marion Creek was known for its uh, crayfish and its turtles. And much to my parents' chagrin, I often brought them home. Mm -hmm. And um, we had this, uh, they indulged, and I had this big, I don't know, 20-gallon tank that they made me keep outside uh, where I, um, I, I had about, you know, 10 of them, 10 turtles and 10 crayfish as, as pets, and uh, it mm. stank. <laughs> as as every, every child yeah. should have, yeah. right? Yeah. So we, we're all parents who have teenagers grew up in a different era. There's a stereotype that young people are particularly glued to their devices these days. How, what's your reaction to that? Uh, oy, is my reaction mm -hmm. to that. Um, so let's, let's start with, uh, you know, sort of some of the hard reality here, which is, uh, the, the generation of children that are growing up today uh, is the most sedentary generation of kids in, in our history. Um, uh, it's the first generation that whose life expectancy is probably less than their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and that stuff about screen time is very true. On average, kids are spending somewhere between five and eight hours a day on their screen and less than an hour a day outside. Not a great, not a great recipe. Um, uh, more optimistically, particularly here in the Bay Area, we are blessed with incredible open space. Within the city limits of, of San Francisco, 18% of our city is, is green space. 18%, that's pretty good. And San Francisco is the first city in the United States of America where 100% of us live within a 10-minute walk of a park. So we have access, and I think, uh, you know, under two or three different mayors who've cared a great deal about this. We've invested five to $600 million in our park system to try to make it more equitable, more welcoming. Um, um, and I think we're doing, a, a, doing a, a pretty good job of that, but we have a big culture shift to ensure that every child has the opportunity to enjoy nature every day. And that is what we should all be working on. Every child uh, should have a nature-based experience every single day. Mm. Rebecca Johnson, you work for a program, iNaturalist, you know, citizen science, where you're trying, getting out into nature and using screens as tools of engagement, right? It's not, you know, that you have, it's not black or white, good or bad. Tell us about screens as tools of engagement and learning in nature. So um, through my work at the California Academy of Sciences, where I co-direct citizen science, um, we design programs and try to work with lots of partners all over the city and the state and the world to um, figure out ways to connect people to nature and at the same time um, help them by using this platform called iNaturalist, an app and a website, um, to make biodiversity observations. And so those observations, like speaking as a scientist, those observations are really important for understanding and doing really good science and um, furthering conservation. But at the same time, um, this tool is a way to connect people to the natural world. And sometimes that sounds a little, a little counterintuitive. Um, but you know, people are inherently curious. And having this app and tool that encourages them to be curious and take pictures of what they're seeing, whether or not they know what it is, and knowing that there's kind of a space where you can take a picture of a plant. And you might not know where it is, but if you take a good enough picture, um, the app and then people online, a community of people will help you learn what it is, is a way to foster curiosity and at the same time use that tool that can sometimes be really isolating, but to connect you to a community of people. It might sometimes be through a screen, but usually the screen is kind of helping the experience. It's a little different than just being isolated. Um, and sometimes um, it's really, there's a generational um, shift that younger people are pretty comfortable um, using an app as a tool um, and don't see it as a barrier, but sometimes it's a way to, to bring people together that maybe are sometimes isolated by the phone in between them. Nusheen Razani, uh, there's a professor at the University of Utah called, named David Strayer. Uh, you referred me to uh, his work. I watched his TEDx uh, talk. He talks about, he's done research about uh, human brains, 20 minutes in science. So tell us about his research and what he's found with people in nature with their phone and without their phone. Sure. Well, I think in general, and this is both the work of David Strayer and many others, if you, if you take an urban person and you you put them in the forest, within a few minutes, you'll see improvement in stress. And so you'll see improvements in cortisol, in heart rate, in blood pressure. 
Um, once you get to around 20 minutes, you'll see improvements in attention span. Um, after an hour, you'll see more physical activity. Um, and then 90 minutes, they've shown that depression goes down. And then when you spend even longer time in nature, and this is one of the studies that Dr. Strayer did where he actually hooked people up to EEG machines while they were backpacking in the wilderness. <laughs> um, and he, you know, he held, he, they had no technology at all. And he seemed, except the EEG machine. Yeah, except the EEG, head, that's yeah. so true. But, <laughs> but what he found is that there seems to, around day three, there's a little bit of a tipping point where your creativity is really maximized <laughs> and um, your cognitive ability goes up. Um, he has also done another study where he looked at um, the changes in brain waves in nature, and then what if you go into nature with your phone? And I'm really sorry to say, I mean, we were just discussing that there are different ways to interact with your phone, but he did show that some of the benefit went away yeah. with the phone. And I think as a pediatrician, one thing that I'm also, and you brought this up, concerned about is parents and parental distraction. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the emotional attachment that happens between a parent and a child when a parent actually looks a child in the eye and mirrors their facial expression, that, that whole interaction is key to the emotional development of the child. And so when both parties are fixated on a screen instead of each other, <laughs> there is a loss of actually what is not, um, you know, what is not optional, what is actually essential to the development of a human being, which is having your parent mirror your emotions. And so I think, um, except for I, naturalist, <laughs> we, we, we need to be aware of our, you know, of the fact that we might be missing out on really enjoying nature together if we're doing it through a screen, yet. Yeah. A lot of people struggle with how much to tell children. I remember some eighth graders coming to me and they did a, a research project and they were very prepared and they looked at me and I looked at them and, and they're looking at me as a authority figure and I didn't know how much to tell them because I think it's kind of dark but so you know how do you talk to a 10 year old versus a 15 year old versus okay. someone younger you got to how do you calibrate what you tell them? I, um, I've been thinking about this topic a lot and um, I've actually been drawing from the research that's done on trauma. Um, there's been research done after 9-11 and after really huge events on how to talk to kids about something very traumatic. Because I don't think we should take it lightly that we're telling children not only that we foresee the entire you know, change of ecosystem, um, but also that we don't really know what to do about it. I think that we have to do that in a developmentally appropriate way. What that research around trauma shows is that children do best when they think that they're part of something and when they have social support and when they know their elders are doing what they can and that they, um, they have a story to tell themselves about what's happening. And so I think, um, you know, for children zero to five, you have to recognize that there's very little separation between the external world and the internal world. And their relationship to a tree or an animal is one of intimate love. And so you really have to talk about the death of that animal in a way that recognizes that you're telling them something they love will be dying. As kids get older, I think you have to progressively give them more leadership in it. But just to wrap it up with um, you know, drawing from the literature on trauma, I think the really important thing is to not say, the world is ending and it's up to you to change it. I think <laughs> like because you're five and you have no power, right? <laughs> I think the thing to say is, you know, yes, what you've heard is true and what you see is true. And my generation is going to do every single thing that we can. But then we actually have to do everything that we can. And what we don't get to will be up to you. Um, and if you have any ideas, I'll try my best to follow you and your lead. But to not like leave it up to them or not say, the world is ending, so you should recycle. 
Like, <laughs> I mean, it just it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Many climate conversations talk about impacts on future generations, and all too often young people are not at the table or in the room. Today, we're pleased to have teens and other young people on the Climate One stage and in the audience. Isha Clark is a high school student and activist in Oakland, California. Sarah Goody is a 14-year-old student in Marin who has organized climate strikes in San Francisco. Um, Isha Clark, you spoke at a rally outside Senator Feinstein's office. So take us to that place, that moment, outside the senator's office. What did it look like? Who was there? And then what happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. I showed up to, I was asked to speak at a Sunrise Movement rally outside of Senator Feinstein's office. There was a crowd of about 100 people, um, very lively, very passionate, and I spoke, and it was great. And um, there were some kids, or youth activists, excuse me, from <laughs> Bay Area, very important, from Bay Area <laughs> Earth Guardians crew who wanted to present a letter that they had written to Senator Feinstein. And they invited all the young people who were there to go up and present the letter. And just for some reason, she happened to be in her San Francisco office that day. And they invited us up after some pushback. For me, it was less about the actual interaction and what happened after that, then what happened after that. Um, there was, I felt, accountability to what just happened. And for me, as a young person, as a person of color, I'm kind of used to people talking to me like that. Let's just be real. And so when I was in that interaction, I didn't really recognize how disturbing it was until I saw that the video hit 10 million views on Twitter and was all over CNN and all over the news. Um, and for me, it was really powerful to have my voice become such an important weight in politics, in media. And, you know, I think the conversation now isn't really about Senator Feinstein anymore. And it's really about politicians in general and power holders in general who aren't and haven't been taking the necessary steps to reverse this climate crisis. You've also said uh, that Senator Feinstein learned and gained respect that, you know, do you think that she, you know, what was the basis for that? When we talked on the phone, you said you thought that she learned and she perhaps gained some respect for you. How do you think it affected her? You know, I hope that all of that is true. And, the, you know, the reality is that we, I don't really know how she how she responded to the interaction, and I would love to have a conversation with her if she's willing about next steps to um, proceed in a more productive manner. Um, I hope that in watching the reaction of that interaction, <laughs> she, uh, like you said, learned from it and realized the power of her voice, especially to young people, to the future generations, and though she's been an extremely powerful force in American politics, that there's still things that she could have done that she didn't. Or, you know, and that goes for her peers as well. And so I think that conversation needs to be had about holding our politicians, even who were powerful people, accountable because there's always something more that can be done. Sarah Goody, you had a climate awakening and I think it was in sixth grade. Um, so tell us, <laughs> tell us about that, you know, how you didn't know much about climate, your journey to where you are now to being a regular climate striker. Yeah, so um, I got involved with climate change in sixth grade after um, learning about climate change um, from my sixth grade teacher, Miss Rebecca Newburn. And uh, once I learned about climate change, I was absolutely terrified. I couldn't believe that they had, that the world had been hiding this issue from me for so long. You know, I looked at all my classmates and I thought, how many of them had actually known about this before this had started? Because truthfully, it was almost none. And after that, I started to feel accountable for what was happening. And I really wanted to make a difference. And I did that through eventually joining an organization called Greening Forward, uh, which is empowering youth to um, act for climate change and getting involved. 
And after that, I was at an event in New York for Greening Forward when I met Alexandria Villasenor, who is a 13-year-old uh, climate striker. She has currently been striking in front of the UN for, I believe, 19 weeks now. And I met her and was completely in awe. You know, she had brought all this attention and power to striking for climate change. And it's part of a movement called Fridays for Future, which was started by a uh, youth activist, Greta Thunberg, in Sweden. And she brought this to the US and really worked and got people involved with it here in the US because, you know, climate change is affecting all of us, not just those who are in Sweden, it's everywhere. So I was really inspired by her and I went home and I started striking um, on my own in San Francisco. I started in front of City Hall and now I am in front of the Ferry Building on every Friday. So yeah. So Sarah Goody, what's that like? You go in front of a, a you know iconic public building, you sit there by yourself. Are you, are you, are you by yourself? What's yeah. it like? <laughs> what do people say to you? What's that experience like being a 14-year-old sitting out there in public <laughs> saying, I'm striking for climate. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit daunting, I would say. <laughs> um, you know, people are definitely giving you stares, you know, why aren't you in school? You shouldn't be doing that. You know, I've had people come up to me, climate change isn't real, go home, like, go to school, you should be in school. But no, you know, why study for a future that's not going to exist? You know, I need to be here now and fighting now for my future. And um, I really just have to focus on the positive and focus on those people who do come up to me and are really like, wow, like, I am, I am so glad. And it's knowing that those people do exist, that do um, believe in climate change and do stand up for what's right. And it's, um, it's really empowering to meet those people because I, I feel fulfilled and like I'm doing what I need to be doing. What do your parents think about skipping school? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> uh, at, at first they were kind of skeptical, but um, you know, as a good student, I think they're really supportive of me and my passions, and they really believe that I'm doing this for the right cause, and that by doing this, I'm standing up for not just myself, but for my generation as well as future generations for what needs to be taken into account now. And they've been really supportive this whole time, and uh, yeah, they're awesome. Isha Clark, you had a dream of being a surgeon. You've always loved medicine, and I can attest that you have the <laughs> skills because just before we were about to come on, uh, Sarah got a nosebleed backstage, <laughs> and Isha was right there taking care of her. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you, know, you, were right, you were right there, you know, drink water, tilt your head back, the whole thing. So um, you still think you're going to be on that surgeon path, or has this experience changed that in some way? Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I used to obsess over the future and what I was going to do. And like, I don't know, but I've recently been allowing myself to step back from that and to really focus on keeping my options open. And I think that there's a way for everyone to be, or hopefully there should be a way for everyone to um, combine everything that they love doing, that they're passionate about. I love medicine. I love uh, politics in some ways. I love like <laughs> activism. I love art. I don't know. I want to find a way to be able to combine everything yeah. if that's possible. Do you talk about climate, uh, Sarah Goody, uh, at school? Or do you feel like you're kind of, you know, you said you, to me earlier, you don't have a lot of friends at school. You know, do you, do you find it hard to talk to regular <laughs> teenagers <laughs> about the, you know, the climate situation? Yeah, well, I've always been told I'm like a very uh, wise beyond my age and <laughs> very mature. So, you know, um, when I see these people, I see them kind of as a younger version of myself, someone who's not really as mature, someone who doesn't have the same skills and knowledge that I do. So it's definitely... Um, harder to talk to someone about climate change when what they want to talk about is like TikTok videos or, you know, what's the newest thing happening on Snapchat, you know? Um, so it's definitely harder to bring those conversations in, especially when I do, I usually get made fun of or I get, um, 
you know, people don't want to talk about those things because they don't want to feel guilty. Um, but luckily, I have a science teacher at my school who I feel real, I can always trust and talk to who has, you know, the same beliefs and ideals that I do. And that has really been what has grounded me throughout this experience is knowing that I have, you know, an ally and a mentor that I can trust and uh, confide in. Isha Clark, how has your peer group responded? Do you talk to them about climate? I mean, now, um, do they think it's relevant to them? You know, I think that a lot of young people have the potential to get involved in this movement and have the the skills and the drive to be able to do that and don't have the resources to be able to get involved. And so I think that Yes, to answer your question, at school, I try to, when I'm not doing homework or (laughs) the million other things I'm doing at school, I try to talk to my friends and my peers and get them to come out to the events that I'm planning with Youth Versus Apocalypse. And some of them do show, and I think a lot of them are getting excited about this movement that at times can be very depressing. So I think there's so much potential in young people, even in the ones who are ignoring and (laughs) wanting to do TikTok videos. I think there's, they just have to be reached a little bit harder. (laughs) Sarah Goody, how do you deal with the anxiety or fear, knowing what you know, being climate conscious at such a young age? Yeah, um, it's definitely a lot, you know, uh, knowing that this will lead, if not acted upon now, to the end of humanity and our society. It's a lot, um, but I think the way to cope with it is uh, truly by acting. I find that a really great way to cope with it because I know that I'm I'm doing my part and I feel at least um, some sort of responsibility to do something so when I am doing something I feel like I'm finally you know like there is hope so that's definitely one way. Some years ago, there was a woman named Abigail Bora who uh, went to a UN climate conference and she stood up and she shouted down Todd Stern, who was the then US climate negotiator. Uh, She went on Amy Goodman uh, (laughs) and then she came on Climate One and uh, I think her parents only heard about the thing on NPR that, what are you doing shouting at that diplomat? (laughs) Uh, um, And I lost track of her, but I hope that we won't lose track of you too because I really hope that, you know, in a couple of years you'll come back, keep in touch with us because I'm really curious where your arc's going to go. I think you're going to be going places in this movement, so. Thank you for your courage and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you.